How's everybody doing tonight, all right? It's certainly great to see everybody, it really is. Uh, it just brings me some comfort and serenity when I can gather with my brothers and sisters, like-minded people, you know? It's getting hard, and hard about there to communicate. Um, you see how dark it's getting out there, and people just live, want to live their own way, and have, they don't want to follow the principles, you know? And it's a tough thing, and we do, you know? Just pray for them so their eyes can be opened, you know? Even pray for us, it might fall into some traps as we go on this journey. It's, it's, it's a tough one. Uh-huh. All right, we've got an awesome scripture up there before we get started with our study in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Let's go there. If you have your Bible. One thing we know for sure, that God never takes away our free will choices. He simply gives us the power now to make the right ones Amen. in every circumstance. Amen? Amen? As we live by the Spirit, not the flesh. Because the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. If we make decisions in our flesh as Christians, there is still consequences even bigger than before we found Him. Because now we're enlightened and we know all truth. And when we, when we go our own way, God has a way of uh, getting us back on track. And sometimes He's got to use pain. So it's better to stay on track than to get off track and have to get the ride. <laughs> All right, because he's never going to let us go. Amen? Amen? He's always going to be working on us, even when we stop working. He never does. Thank Amen. you, Jesus. Right? Amen. As we go through this journey, we get weary in it, you know? We're not of it. All right, let's go back to verse 11. i got to back up a little bit on this. All right, now it's time to put everything aside that ever might be on your mind. But listen what the Spirit is trying to say to the church tonight. Because the Holy Spirit is going to take over now, okay? Amen. All right. Mm-hmm. As soon as the Word of God comes out, it's no longer me. It's God. Hallelujah. Verse 11. This command I am giving you today is not too difficult for you, okay? And it is not beyond your reach. So everything in the Bible is not too difficult for us in the Spirit <laughs> and not beyond our reach. Mm-hmm. It is not kept in heaven so distant that you must ask, Who will go up to heaven and bring it down so we can hear it and obey? It is not kept beyond the sea so far away that you must ask, Who will cross the sea to bring it to us so we can hear it and obey? No, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart so that you can obey it. Now listen, today, I am giving you a choice between life and death between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to keep His commands, decrees, and regulations. And how do we keep them? By walking in His ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are about to enter and to occupy. So what would he say now? If you listen and obey, and you start to build his kingdom here, by listening and obeying the words, he's going to build and bless his people. Amen? Amen. As long as we listen and obey and use it for his purposes. Look what it says. The Lord your God will bless you. Look, if you do this, you will live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are about to enter and occupy. But, look at verse 17, there's always Bible buts. But if your hearts turn away, and you refuse to listen, and if you are drawn away to serve and worship other gods, or start to follow other things in this life, then I warn you now that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live a long good life in the land you are crossing, the Jordan, to occupy. Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. Now look at verse 20. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God. This is how you make the choice. Loving the Lord your God obeying Him, and committing yourself firmly to Him. Three things. You can make this choice by what? Loving the Lord your God, obeying what He says, and committing yourself firmly to Him. This is the key to your life. Can I get an amen for that? Listen, if you follow these principles, this is the key to your life. And if you love 
and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors Abram, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Boy, that's what he's saying to that us now. Look, if you just obey what he says to do, he simply gives us the power to do it so you can live a good long life down here, right? And enjoy and build his kingdom here. Is there any amen for that? Amen. Now, if you're not doing that and you're not having a joyful life, it's because either you're not following the principles of the Bible, you're not loving the Lord your God, and you're not committing yourself fully to him. Because that takes time. Right? It takes time to fully commit ourselves to him. Because a lot of us still want to do things that we want to do. And that's just the way it is. And as we slowly, as we slowly grow, we we start to outgrow that stuff and not want to do it anymore. If you have the Spirit of God in you, you, those things are starting to lose their power over you. But if they're starting to gain power, you have to understand that your flesh is taking over and you're making the wrong choices. That's just the way it is. Everybody in here has their choices to make. And you can't escape the consequences. Amen? Amen. That's why we have the Bible to give us a guideline on what to obey and what to follow. Amen? Amen. Because once you're enlightened, you can't get unenlightened. Amen? Amen. All right, now i got an awesome scripture for us before we get started. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody know what that one is? Yes. Yeah. Well, if you don't know, you're going to know now, because we're going to talk about it recite. <laughs> I'm going to read verse 1, and then when I hit verse 4, when I hit verse 4, we all read together, okay? Okay. Because I'm going to give you the principle of why love is the greatest. You've already changed to get there. And the page is turning. Verse 1. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others... I would only be a noising gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans, and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. You ready now? Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous nor boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. I get an amen for that. That's the kind of love that God has given each and one of us believers. That kind of love. Human love has limitations on it. His love has no limitations. Amen? And we learn the Bible, and we study the Bible, so we can have that kind of love, and show it in our lives. Can I get an amen? amen. Now, how hard is that? And if you tell somebody you love them, that's what they mean as a Christian. Patient, kind, not proud or rude. Just think about it. The world's love? Yeah, I love you. The next thing you know, you're saying something rude, or you say you're being obnoxious. It's just, in the spirit, we can't do that. I mean, in the flesh, we can't do that. God's kind of love, God loves us that much that he keeps no record of being wrong. He says, you go do likewise. You love everybody in the room? That's the kind of love God calls us to love, each and every one of us, here and outside of here. Because there is no hate in God. The only thing God hates is sin. God does not hate sinners. He hates sin. Because sin is what contaminates people's lives. Amen? And sin doesn't just hurt you, it hurts other people. That's why God hates it so much. Can I get an amen for that? So listen, when you're ready to attack somebody, don't attack them, pray for them. Because the devil is behind them, controlling them to say sin and do sinful things. The devil wants us to attack people and ruin our testimony. Amen? Don't let it happen. It's simply because 
There's a chink in our armor and the devil got his way in because we're living sinful somewhere. So the devil comes in and he makes ground in the, in the life and then he causes problems. Can I get an amen? amen? So we have to understand it's not the person. Hate the sin, not the sinner. We're called to love one another. But let me tell you something about love. Love is not some warm, get away with murder thing. Okay? Love is in your face confrontational if something wrong is happening in someone's life. And this church is always going to confront that that way. Amen? Amen? Because we love you, we teach truth. It's the truth that sets us free. And if you're not willing to hear the truth, you're actually rejecting what God wants to say. Amen? Amen. Okay, just remember that. Keep that in mind. All right. Let's go to, we're going to go to our scripture. We're going to talk about God's grace tonight again, how grace works. How many of us need God's grace? <laughs> We have to understand, okay? I'm learning about God's grace as I grow as a believer, how powerful it really is. If you use it the right way and what it was meant to do, okay? If you use it the wrong way, it'll destroy you. Mm -hmm. If you use it the right way, it'll save you and give you life. Amen? Because we all need a lot of grace each and every day, right? Mm -hmm. To keep going. All right. The grace of God and how it works in our lives is arguably the most important concept, okay, for you to understand and live by in the battle to become godly. Because it is so important, the enemy of our souls has created much confusion and controversy on this topic. But if you can fight your way clear in understanding and applying God's grace, you will experience a close relationship with God and a consistent victory over sin. Amen? God's grace is more powerful. You know how powerful your sin nature is, right? Can I get an amen for that? Well, we all know how powerful our sin nature is when it takes over. Right? It controls us. Do you realize God's grace is more powerful than that? Where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. God gives us the grace to turn away from our sin nature. But it was something we could never do before. He did for us what we could never do for ourselves. Amen? Save us from ourselves. Okay, I want to, last, we talked, we went two, two sessions on this. I want us to go to, we're going to start off in um, Jude. We ended, off, we ended off in the end of the book of Jude, in verse 18, and we're going to start there. I'm going to keep the context, so as we move on, it's going to get really, really... God, listen, if you, if you understand God's grace right, you will enjoy your Christian life more than you ever, ever could know. And it won't destroy you. It'll give you more life than you could ever... And more power than you ever, ever could imagine. Amen? Amen? How many of us want some power to overcome what's in our flesh? You know, as soon as we get out of here, right, our flesh wants to take over. As soon as we open our eyes, right? You want to do God's will... But our flesh takes over, right? Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> let's go here. All right. A call to remain faithful. We'll go to verse 17. <coughs> but you, my dear friends, says Jude, he was talking about false teachers, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you that in the last times there will be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. And I, and I defined scoffer to you last week, right? Somebody that makes fun of your religion or makes fun of other people to get enjoyment. In other words, they call that memeing today. They change the name. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. If Christians are making fun of other people, they're actually scoffers. They're in the Bible. They call you scoffer. If you're, if you're gaining pleasure off of someone else's downfall, you're a scoffer. That's what the Bible says. If you're glorifying on someone, even if it's an unbeliever, it doesn't matter who it is. We're never, ever, ever to make fun of other people. We're to pray and build each other up. Amen? Can I get an amen? amen. Look, we're not here to destroy each other and talk about people and run people down. We're here to lift up and edify each other. Not talk about what people's weaknesses are. Amen? All of us are weak. Who didn't sin today? I'm waiting. Okay. So now you know what I'm talking about, right? So what right do we have to say anything about anybody? 
Now look what it says. These are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. So there's actually people that come to church week in and week out and complain and grumble and talk about people, right, and live their own way because they don't have God's spirit in them. You mean you can come to church and not have God's spirit in you? Yes. It says it right here. Don't think because you come to church you've got the spirit of God in you. That's a lie. Because the Bible says the wheat and the weeds are going to grow together. And you'll know my people by their fruit, by their actions, the way they live. Amen? The, the, the evidence of um, salvation is a changed life. Okay? It's a different life. Now, does that happen overnight? No. As we keep coming to church, keep learning the Word of God, we start to outgrow our sin nature. It starts to lose its power over us. Isn't that what you want? Or do you want it to have power over you? Don't you want to be able to say no to it? Yes. Well, you can't say no to it without Jesus. You can't say no to it without the Spirit of God in you. Mm -hmm. And if you're not saying no to it, you're saying, well, I'm not using the Spirit of God, or maybe I don't have it. Mm -hmm. Because something happens to us. Let's go to Romans chapter 2. I just want to, I'm going to get the gist of this. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Pay attention because this is important. Keep an open mind because a lot of people get the mis misconception of what God's grace is and have been taught wrong. Verse 4. Romans chapter 2. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness or his grace is intended to turn you from your sin or cause, bring you to repentance from your sin? Can I get an amen for that? Amen. God's grace and mercy, is a, his kindness is to turn you from sin, not to keep sinning. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Don't get it twisted. A lot of people do. Conviction is something that we should never lose. When we do something that's against God. Amen? You don't want to get dull to that. Many professing Christians, now listen up, wrongly think that God's grace means that he gives out free passes that allow us to sin with no consequences for disobedience. If you emphasize the need to obey God's word or commandments or do good works, they call you a legalist. Okay? If you warn them that their sloppy view of sin will result in God's discipline... They don't want to hear it. Their mantra is, I'm not into your rules, kind, or works, kind of salvation, religion. I'm under grace, not law. For them, grace means permission for sloppy living. This message corrects both of these serious misconceptions of God's grace. Paul shows that God's grace, first it saves us, okay? And then it trains his people for godliness and good deeds. Can I get an amen? Amen. He saves us unto godliness and good deeds. Amen? We don't work for salvation, but salvation works. Are you with me so far? Yes. Okay. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. You know, you're going to have to move some pages in your Bible because that's where we're going. Who wants to know the, God, the right way to what God's grace is? How many of us get confused about it? Really? It's the most confusing thing in the church. People love to go to a church that this tells you. God's grace covers everything. Don't worry about your sins. They've been taken care of. Don't worry about it. You're not going to get changed down here. You're going to change when you go to heaven. That's a lie. That's a lie. Don't listen to it. Because you're not going to heaven that way. Because when you believe something, you become it. Amen. You can't separate it. You can't separate it. All right, first, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 1. I'm going to confirm it right now. Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. All right, so um, Paul is telling Timothy to be strong through God's grace, not weak through God's grace to keep doing wrong, correct? He's telling you to be strong through God's grace. How many of us want to use God's grace to become stronger? 
Okay. This is what he says now. Just listen. That God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. So God gives us the grace to be a soldier, right? And not get tied up in civilian affairs. Get tied in, the, tied in with the affairs of God. Mm -hmm. Amen? Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Let's go. Just stay with me now. So God gives us the grace to endure suffering. How many of us suffer as being a Christian? God gives us the grace to endure it. Look what it says in Philippians chapter 2. Verse 12. I love to hear the pages of the Bible turning. Because let me tell you something. The power is in the Word. Look what it says. Dear friends, you've always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. So what is he saying? He's saying work hard to show the results of your salvation. Work hard to show what your salvation did for you. How it changed you and created a new person within you. You have to work hard for that. You don't have to work to get saved. You have to work hard to get rid of your sin nature and show the, sin, the salvation that he gave you. Look what he says. Obeying God. Look at Work hard to show the results of your salvation. How am I going to do that? By obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. What's the desire and the power? The grace of God gives us the desires and the power to do what pleases Him, not to continue in sin. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. To do what pleases Him. Firmly, hold firmly to the word of life. Then, on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain, and that my work was not useless. So God gives us the grace to what? Do what's right for the glory of God. Not continue living in sloppy. Does anybody really believe that that's what God's grace is for? No, no. To do whatever you want to do? No. Do you really think that like God saved you so he could just keep sinning? No. And continue in it and not come up from it? And how can you have God's spirit in you if you don't if you think that? But if you go somewhere and believe that, you're believing a lie. Mm -hmm. Because that's not why God saved you. Mm -hmm. He didn't save you to dull your conscience. He saved you to heighten it so you don't do it. Mm -hmm. Amen. If somebody wants their conscience dull, they'll go somewhere to say, Don't worry about your sins, even pay for past, present, future. Just keep on sinning. Don't worry, you're going to heaven. And <laughs> you know, you keep hearing that. You keep hearing that, then all of a sudden, sin doesn't have any conviction in you anymore. You live a sinful life without even hearing, without even feeling the conviction of God. You're never going to get that here. Because what saves you is conviction to do the right thing. Because we have to fight this flesh. How many of us fight the flesh every day? Well, it's never going away. Have you not noticed you're going to make peace with that? That you need the power to say no to it. And this is what we're going to teach, how to get the power. Who wants that power? Who wants to say no? You know when you want to do something wrong, how powerful it is? Yeah. Don't you want the power to say no to that? Mm -hmm. Well, nobody else is going to be able to do that for you except God. And understanding what His ways are. And I'm going to teach you His ways, the proper way. Simple and understandable, okay? Are you understanding what I'm saying so far? Yes. Pretty simple, okay. Let's go to um, Titus now, chapter 2. I'm going to promote right teaching. Verse 1 of Titus chapter 2. 
Titus became a pastor under Paul. As for you, Titus, promote, listen to what it says. He didn't say promote the kind of teaching. He said promote the kind of living. Did you hear that? Promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. What you're taught will reflect on the way you live. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. If you're taught right, you will live right. If you're taught wrong, you will live wrong. Amen. We have to be taught to live right. Like I said before, we don't have to be taught how to do wrong. Just let that boy down for one minute. And we'll show you how much he knows about doing wrong already. Mm -hmm. He's going to write right to the plugs. He's going to write to run to everything he's not supposed to do. And nobody had to teach him how to do that. Mm -hmm. Amen. But tell him no and see if he can stop. <laughs> tell him no. Can he stop? Will he stop? No. He won't stop without some kind of d discipline, correct? Amen. Well, neither will a sinner. A sinner will not stop without any correction or conviction. It's the same thing. We're like little kids. That's why we're born again. You have to teach us how to do the right thing. We don't know how. We just want to live our own way. And if you don't want to listen to the teaching to do the right thing, that means you don't want to live God's way. Because you can't have both. You can't come to church and think, I can live my way. And when I go to church, God's going to be happy with me because I went to church. And then leave and go live a sinful life. Mm -hmm. Believe me when I tell you, you're going to get chased worse than anybody else. Amen. Now look what it says. He's teaching, he's teaching the whole gamut here. This is awesome. Listen to this. Teach the older men. Any older men in here? Oh, we're a bunch of, no, we've got everybody's under 18 in here, right? <laughs> Teach the oh look, he goes through the gamut here. Teach the older men to exercise self-control. Self-control has to what's exercise? Wait a minute. Exercise self-control. How do you exercise something? When you go to the gym, right, you get on the treadmill or the machine and you start to exercise, right? If you just go to the gym and don't start to exercise, what happens? Nothing. You don't grow. Can I get an amen for that? Yeah. No, here's the simple truth about spiritual what? growth. It says exercise self-control. You have to practice self-control. When something that you desire comes your way, you have to practice to say no to it. If you don't practice that, you'll never be able to. Mm. It has to be taught over and over and over again to say no to it. How many of us still do things we don't want to do anymore? Mm -hmm. How many of us get angry still when things don't go our way? What do you do with that anger? Does God's love come out of your mouth when you're angry? <laughs> well, what's taking over then? Why can't you stop? Because the devil says don't. Sin by letting anger control you. Did you know that once anger controls you, it's a sin? Mm -hmm. Why? Because it gives a foothold to the devil. Mm -hmm. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. How many of us go to bed angry? Mm -hmm. And wake up the next morning and start to get a resentment. Mm -hmm. right? Why can't we control anger? Everybody says, well, you know, I'm not a drug addict. I'm doing... How come you can't control when you get angry? Mm -hmm. How come you can't control what comes out of your mouth? It's like you're possessed. Mm -hmm. How many of us have anger problems in this room? Mm -hmm. Well, who's the only one that can fix? You tried to, have you tried to fix anger problems all your life, and how's it working? Mm -hmm. How are you and your anger problems working? Are they, is your self-help working for you? I'm going to stop doing it? Or do you need God's help? You're going to finally tap on and say, God, I can't stop. Mm -hmm. Amen. So let me tell you something. It goes way beyond the outward things. It goes to the inward things. Look what he's saying. Teach the older men to exercise self-control, to be worthy of respect. Do you want respect from somebody? It says to be worthy of respect. If you're not a respectful person, how will you expect to get respect from people? Can I get an amen? Amen. You say, oh, you don't respect me. Well, why don't you respect me? Maybe I'm not respecting others. Mm -hmm. So how am I expect to get respect? It says it right here. Listen, it's very simple he's teaching us. To be worthy of respect and to live wisely. They must have sound faith and be filled with love and patience. Men of the church, he's talking to you, older men. This is talking to you. 
Teach the oldest men to exercise self-control, to be worthy of respect, and to live wisely. They must have sound faith to be filled with love and patience. How many of us are filled with love and patience? How many of us are trying to get there? It's a process, isn't it? You call yourself a Christian. This is what Titus teaches these things. And this is what we learn, this is where to learn them when we come to church. Now look what it says. Similarly, verse 3. Teach the older women. Any older women in here? Nope. <laughs> Please, whatever you do, don't ask a woman how old they are. You learn these things wisely. <laughs> look what it says about the older women, though, no? He's running the gamut here. The, look it. Teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Greek, be enslaved to much wine. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children. Say the older women, with their, they train the younger women to love their husbands, because that's something that has to be developed in everybody. Amen. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. This is what we're supposed to do with each other. This is what the church is built on. Look at it, to love their husbands and children, to live wisely and be pure, to work in their homes. Some ministers need to care for their homes, to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands. Ooh. <laughs> you heard that, right? That's what it says in the Bible, by the way. You're a Christian man and a Christian woman supposed to be loving and submissive to their husbands. It says it right here. And they, then, why? Why, did, why do I have to be that way? Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. Mm. You see it? When a woman's disrespectful to her husband, it brings shame on the word of God. If, if, no, you don't have to say amen. Or, look, this is, this is to teach us. How many want to get taught? Or do you just want to live your own way? Well, if you want to live your own way, then you're in the wrong place. Because we're here to live God's way and to learn how to do it. In the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely. And you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Well, I'm not into work salvation. So why am I going to do good works of every kind? To be an example, that's why. To show people that Christ lives in me so other people can follow in that. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Okay. Salvation works. Look, it says it right here. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. See it? My teaching has to line up with what I do. Teach the truth so that your teachings can't be criticized. Then those who oppose us will be ashamed and have nothing bad to say about us. See it? By, my li by me living the right way, and anybody oppose me, by the way I live will shame them when they say something bad about me. Mm -hmm. And believe me, people do. People talk about the pastors all the time. That's all they do. Right? Instead of building them up, they tear them down. And guess who you have to deal with? Jesus. You have to deal with God, not me. Because mm -hmm. when God chooses somebody, He chooses them. And He protects them. Mm -hmm. Alright, now look what it says. Now look at verse 9. It says, slaves. Now we would say Employees. Because we're no longer slaves. Now I'm going to say employees must always obey their masters or their boss and do their best to please them. They must not talk back or steal, but must show themselves to be entirely trustworthy and good. Then they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive in every way. So you go to work. When you go to work for Jesus, you show respect and love and kindness. People get attracted to that. If you're not, what do people say? What church are you going to? You say you have God. What church do you go to? This is why you have to live God's way. Because people are watching and they want to know what God is all about. And that's why they see the hypocrisy. Because nobody wants to live the way. We say we come to church to live God's way. And then we don't. 
The Bible tells me when I go to work, treat my boss like I would treat Jesus. And the Bible tells me even if my boss is a taskmaster or if he's doing the wrong thing, it doesn't matter. He's still above me. You go to work for somebody every day, the Bible says to treat him like you treat Jesus. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Tell me you can do that without Jesus. Come on. Tell me you can obey and be like that without Jesus. No, when you obey, when you start what? Criticizing the boss, running them down, talking about them, stealing from them, right? And then leaving them? That's a great testimony for the Lord, isn't it? Yeah. It's a, remind me not to go to the church you got taught from. That not only stains God, it stains the church and the people in it. That's why it's important to live right. You hear, oh, I'm not into work salvation. No, salvation works so others can get saved. Amen. So we can bring others into the kingdom by the way we live. Amen. Of course it matters. Some people have had to go to a church and this tells them, don't worry about it. Live whatever way you want and then get your conscience seared. And then what? You have to answer to God. Now look what it says. Look at verse 11. Now, now he's going to say something here. Does everybody get what I'm saying so far? Yeah. Yes. All right, now he's saying, now he's told, now he ran a gamut, and then he's saying, for the grace of God has been revealed. That's what God's grace reveals. For you to live that kind of way. Look what it says. Bringing salvation to all people. I'm going to explain that now. We are instructed. See, we, and we are instructed or we are being trained to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. He gave his life, listen now, how many of us want to know why Jesus gave his life? I'm going to explain it right now. <clears throat> Look what it says. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin. See it? To cleanse us and to make us his very own people, totally committing to doing good deeds. Committing to, what do you mean? I'm not into work salvation. Why am I going to do good deeds? You see how people can talk the wrong stuff? Good deeds are the result of your salvation. Amen. Always wanting to do good instead of doing bad. That's the result of your salvation. Now look at verse 15. I like Titus. Me and Titus are going to want to get along good because <laughs> look what he tells me. You must teach these things and encourage the believers to do them. How many churches teach these things to people and encourage other people to do them? You have the authority to correct them when necessary. Mm -hmm. So don't let anyone disregard what you say. Does anybody got a problem with what I just said? No. no. Okay, because the Bible just said it. He says, don't let anybody. I have the authority to teach this stuff. Can I get an amen or no? Yeah, what do you, you want to get taught truth or don't you? Amen. Mm -hmm. You're going to get it taught here. And I'm, not, I'm not here to please you. Mm -hmm. I'm here to please God who called me to do this for you. Mm -hmm. Either you want to live the way he calls you to do or you don't. Amen. There's no, there's no like in between. Oh, I'm going to go to church and do my thing when I leave. It doesn't work that way. He calls us out of that. Mm -hmm. He calls us out of darkness into the light. Amen. As a matter of fact, our Monday group is called stepping into the light, coming out of the dark is the Bible study, right? Amen. Okay. The word now. I'm going to explain a little bit now. Okay. Is everybody with me so far? Mm -hmm. I ain't got much time wrap up. I'm going to explain this. The word for that opens verse 11, it says, for the grace of God has been revealed, links these verses to what he just said in 2, 1 to 10. Paul has shown that various groups of believers should beautify their lives with godliness and good deeds so as to attract others to the Savior. Paul mentioned... Paul's mention of God our Savior in 2.10 causes him to elaborate on the theological basis for our salvation and how understanding that inevitably leads to a life of godliness and good deeds. At the heart of everything taught in the Bible 
is this crucial concept of God's grace. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. God's, one, here's a, I'm going to give you the principle now. One, God's grace brings salvation to all people. In verse 2.11. Now listen to what I'm going to say now. In verse two, now everybody might think, what do you mean? Everybody's saved? That's not what he means. I'm going to explain why. When Paul writes, for the grace of God has been revealed, he is referring to the embodiment of grace in the person of Jesus Christ, who was full of grace and truth which is in John 1, verse 14. So the Word became human. As a matter of fact, go there. Go to John 1, verse 14. I'm going to just back it all up. How's that? You want to get it backed up? You get any doubts about it? I'm going to back it up with Scripture. First John 1, John 1, verse 14. We're going to, as a matter of fact, we're studying John right now, right? We're going to be coming up with these upper chapters. They're awesome. Mm -hmm. So the Word became human, <clears throat> Greek became flesh, and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, or he was full of grace and truth. Also in 117, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. It is not that God's grace is missing from the Old Testament, okay? No one was saved in the Old Testament apart from God's grace. But as John 117 states, the contrast, for the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. God rightly could have sent His Son to condemn us and judge us. But instead, in John 3, 17, or 16, For God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Amen? Amen. So how do we get saved? By believing in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Okay, so we understand that concept. Zacharias uses the verb appear to refer to the coming of the Messiah, whom he calls the sunrise from on high, who will shine, appear upon those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace, Luke 1, The coming of Jesus Christ was the light of grace, of God's salvation, dawning upon this sin-darkened world. Now, can anybody say that this world is not darkened by sin? Go out there and listen to, look at the way things are going right. I, I pray for this country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Because they say they want God and God we trust. But anything goes now out there. You could, you're not sure, you're not sure if you're a man or a woman or this or that. It's listen, instead of using the principles of the Bible, we're making our own principles now. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, wait a minute. The guidebook is right here. We went by these principles this miracle was founded on. Mm -hmm. Now let's take them out. Yeah. And think God's going to bless this country. No, it's going to come out of his judgment. Mm -hmm. So, you know what believers are doing? They're falling into that. They're accepting that instead of the Bible. Mm -hmm. They're accepting sin into the church. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Judgment is going to begin in God's household. Yeah. He's going to judge the people that know the truth already. Yeah. Then he's going to judge the unbelievers. Mm -hmm. So don't buy into it. Believe me, stick with the Bible. If you know what's good for you, because God is a consuming fire. He's not no joke. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What Paul means that God's grace is revealed in the person of Christ offers salvation to all that hear of it. In the context, Paul has just spoken to various groups. Older men, older women, younger women, younger men, and slaves. So when he goes on to say that God's grace brings salvation to all people, he means to all types of people, including those whom the world despises, even to slaves. No one is beyond the reach of God's grace. Amen? Amen? This does not mean that all people are saved or will be saved. The Bible is uniformly clear that there are two separate final destinations for all people. Okay? Those who by God's grace believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior will go to heaven. Those who do not believe in Christ will pay the penalty of eternal separation from God in hell. Two choices. 
But the good news of God's grace is that no sinner is beyond the reach of God's grace. Oh, thank you, Jesus, right? The Apostle Paul was a persecutor of the church. He called himself the chief of sinners in 1 Timothy 3, 1, 13 and 15. But he experienced God's grace through the cross. If the chief of sinners found mercy, so can you. But there is a major hindrance that will keep you from experiencing God's grace and salvation. Namely, your propensity to self-righteousness or self-help. Paul says that God's grace brings salvation to all people. You don't need salvation unless you are lost and know that you are lost. If you think that you're doing just fine on your own, or that you're going to be able to make it on your own with a little more effort, you won't cry out for a Savior to deliver you. As Jesus said in Luke 5.32, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Amen. By the righteous, Jesus meant the self-righteous. The self-righteous Pharisees did not see their need for a Savior. Mm -hmm. Those who knew that they were sinners did. Before you can appreciate God's grace, you need to know that you are justly under His wrath and condemnation. If you are headed for eternal, ju you are headed for eternal judgment unless someone intervenes. <laughs> You know that the rope is around your neck. God's grace cuts the rope. Even though you are guilty as charged and deserve to die, the Bible says, for your sins. Have you experienced God's grace to bring salvation? If so, you are a changed person. How? And we're going to stop there. Next week we're going to tell you how. How's that? Yeah, let you see. It's coming. More's coming, all right? We've got to close. We're only five minutes over, but that, I had to get to the end of that one. If so, you are changed. You're a changed person. How are you changed? Amen. Something to think about when you leave. Okay? Yeah. All right. Thank you for letting me share that with you. I hope I got something for you to think about and to take with you. Yeah. The girls are going to come up and sing, and we are going to close.